Untold Stories Frodo, My Boy Read by Bluefax and Marcia Velke The sun rose over the rolling hills in the northwest of the old world and shone upon Bag End Under Hill. Its windows reflected the rich greenery of the surrounding garden with the vibrant yellows and reds of the carefully tended flowers that grew there. Master Ham Gamji paused his work pulling out the weeds in a flower bed and raised his head to say good morning to Mr. Baggins as he emerged from his beautiful round green door whistling. Good morning, Mr. Bilbo. It's a beautiful summer's morning, don't you think? Oh, good morning, Mr. Hamfast. Uh, yes, yes. After the last days of rain, the sun is a blessing. Bilbo answered with the smile of someone who would sit with a good pipe in the garden. But on the other hand, your garden needs an extra pruning after such a downpour. I have enough work for two days here, the gaffer replied, resuming his work. I would gladly help you, Master Hamfast. Uh, My joints are a little rusty, you know, and working in the garden would be invigorating. But this morning, I thought to go to the East Farthing. I want to visit old Rory and my cousins at Brandy Hall. I would have left by now but I ended up being late with breakfast. Don't worry, Mr. Bilbo. Ham's son will come to help me later. I sent him to Bywater to get some compost on Farmer Cotton's house. Sam went with him. If I mention there's work in the garden, I can barely keep him indoors anymore. Sam was about eight at that time, but he already loved the plants with more fervor than his father, and he also loved the stories that Mr. Bilbo told him. Your boys are adorable, Master Hamfast. A pity I won't be able to help you today. Such a glorious day, Bilbo said, contemplating the landscape in front of him. It is, Mr. Bilbo. It is like a painting, the gaffer agreed, looking up. Will you be out for many days? he asked, for it was his job to care for Bag End whenever Bilbo left. Uh, Four days at most, my friend. Well... (sighs) I will be going, before the scent of this beautiful garden convinces me to stay a little longer and smoke some old Toby. The two (laughs) laughed, and Bilbo turned down the well-trodden bagshot row. Have a nice journey, Mr. Bilbo, the gaffer called after him. Thank you, Master Hamfast. Have a nice day, Bilbo replied with the same vigour, raising his hand in a farewell. It really was a splendid morning and walking was one of Bilbo's favourite habits, besides eating, reading, and writing his book. He strolled leisurely down the hill, along the row surrounded by hedges on both sides, taking a deep breath of morning air. He raised his hand to greet Daddy Twofoot, who sat in front of the house at number two, Bagshot Row, smoking his wooden pipe. His wife was sitting beside peeling pumpkins, Bilbo saw her whispering something in her husband's ear while he raised his hand in response to Bilbo's greeting. Hmm, for sure she is telling her husband I will vanish again, Bilbo thought. He had already become used to being the subject of many conversations in Hobbiton and Bywater since his adventure in the East. From a highly respected Baggins, he had descended into an adventurous and weird Took but he wasn't worried about his ruined reputation. He had more important things to deal with and was already late. He pressed forward, passing Sandyman's mill and crossing the bridge over the water. At the crossroads, he took the eastern course towards Bywater. After walking more than a mile, he could see to the north the hills past the lake, dotted with hobbit holes with their little gardens following the water margin. 
As he reached Bywater, a buzz of laughter and lively conversation came from the open windows of the Green Dragon Inn. It was a large house with a green painted dragon on a wooden banner, followed by a row of beautiful trees on the lake shore. Bilbo stopped, out of breath, in the courtyard of the inn, where Eddie Smallborough was already waiting for him with a pony. Uh, sorry I'm late, Eddie, my boy. Uh, scones, vests and sunflowers, and I ended up losing track of time. Bilbo was finally convinced that he needed to start walking again as he breathed heavily. His vest, which had been too tight at the waist that morning, had not fully convinced him. Oh, there's no need to apologise, Mr Bilbo. I took the opportunity to have a few beers and a few snacks at the tavern. Now I'm ready to face the day. Eddie proudly slapped his big belly. At least until lunch, he said, handing the reins to Bilbo, who gave him some coins and climbed on the pony, before saying goodbye to him and following the villager's main road. Bilbo rode at a quick trot. It was 40 miles to the Brandywine Bridge, and he had to hurry if he wanted to get to Frogmorton before sunset. He smelled fresh bread coming from a fair further ahead, with several colourful tents and outdoor tables that was filled with hobbits happy to sell and buy. Bilbo greeted the passers-by with compliments and followed the turn to the sloping path with high banks and low hedges at the top that ended on the Great East Road. It was past mid-afternoon when Bilbo Baggins arrived in Frogmorton, a hobbit's village on the edges of the Great East Road about 18 miles from Bywater, with thatch roof cottages, round windows and doors, and beautiful gardens. Eddie had not oversold his pony. It was one of the fastest of the Shire. Lightning lived up to the fame that his owner gave him. Bilbo stopped at the inn called The Floating Log and couldn't resist the prospect of beer and delicious food. Also, he was surrounded by local hobbits who loved stories, poetry and songs. But when he sat on the bed of his room at the inn, then Bilbo realised he was anxious. He had made the decision two nights ago and he didn't want to wait any longer. But he was afraid. Frodo was his favourite younger cousin. There was something in him that he did not see in anyone else. A burning flame in his eyes every time he heard Bilbo's tales of his adventures or the stories of the elves and the elder days. But to adopt him, to ask him to leave Brandywine Hall and come to live with Bilbo at Bag End was a big step. And Bilbo thought about whether Frodo would be willing to make such a big change in his life. And he found himself after so long with a sense of insecurity that he barely remembered existed. At dawn, after having a reinforced breakfast, Bilbo climbed lightning and followed the road, leaving the beautiful village behind. He wished to stop to smoke at least for a while and look at the East Farthing's fields bathed by the colours of the day. Around him, the lowlands were lush and well tended with the promise of an abundant harvest. The lands of the green hills, full of leafy trees in the south, filled the landscape. But after a fierce fight between the pipe and his destination, his pipe lost the battle, and he followed the road, humming one of his favourite travel songs. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can. Pursuing it with eager feet Until it joins some larger way Where many parts and errands meet And whither then I cannot say Dun 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 d
After several miles, passing fields, houses and hobbit holes, Bilbo sighted in the distance the Buck Hill and the Brandywine running in front of it. He had just crossed Whitwell and could already see the stone arch bridge in the distance. He made the pony trot faster. The Great East Road through the Shire was pretty quiet that day, with only two or three hobbits on foot and a dwarf with a wagon probably going to the Blue Mountains. Bilbo greeted Hob Hayward as soon as he arrived at the north gate of the Hedge of Buckland. Bilbo had already lost count of how many good mornings and good afternoons he had said that day. He followed the main row, allowing the pony to trot slowly now. The sun was setting, casting a reddish light on the Brandywine and the houses just above the Buck Hill. Smoke came out of the chimneys, announcing that dinner was being prepared. Bilbo's stomach made a noise announcing its indignation, for it had only received a meager roadside lunch, some fruit in the afternoon, and nothing else. Bilbo tried to ignore it, and entered a path on the right that went down to the road between the hall and the river. As he went down, he could see the hall's side doors and windows. A little closer, and he could hear the calm dance of the waters of the Brandywine, already almost hidden in the twilight. Further ahead, on a pier with a ferry tied on, a hobbit was lighting a lamp attached on a pole, illuminating the small wooden expanse. Brandy Hall stood imposing, with its more than 100 windows and latches scattered over the hill. There were three front doors. Bilbo dismounted from lightning, and stood in front of the middle one of the three big round doors. Taking a deep breath to ease his nerves, he rang the bell. Without realizing it, he put his hand in his pocket looking for his ring. Whenever he was in such situations, the temptation to use it increased. He had not used his magic ring very much. Only to escape from the Sackville Bagginses and unwanted visitors when there was no other way. He kept it on a thin chain in his pocket after it had slipped out of his finger several times. He closed his hand, clasping the ring. The door opened, filling the entrance with yellowish light. A middle-aged hobbit lady invited Bilbo in, recognizing him at once. It was Amaranth Brandybuck, one of the daughters of Master Gorbadak who had decided not to marry, devoting her life to caring for her father, who was of advanced age, and the Brandywine Hall. Gathering a bunch of children, with grandchildren and great-grandchildren, all living under one roof, required a firm hand and many political skills, of which Amaranth had plenty. Cousin Bilbo, what a pleasant surprise. Please come in. The entrance chamber of Brandywine Hall was a huge round room, with one tunnel going right and another to the left, and a large arch further ahead revealing yet another tunnel. There was a huge chandelier in the center, and a floor covered in a mosaic of tiles. There were several doors leading to wardrobes. Amaranth opened one of them, putting Bilbo's coat and travel things inside. I guess you must be hungry. Amaranth knew the hobbits very well. Bilbo wanted to disagree out of politeness, but his stomach gave one more of those indignant announcers right at that moment. Amaranth smiled. Dinner will be in an hour, but I'll get you some snacks in room two. There were several living rooms in the hall, and all had numbers as well as the bedrooms. Frodo will be so happy about your visit. She said, heading towards the South Hall. Is he at the hall right now? Bilbo asked, trying to mask his jitteriness. He is not here yet, Amaranth replied in an angry tone. He always goes out to who knows where and comes back who knows when. He even missed dinner a few times. The 
dinner, Master Baggins. I always tell him that his escapades will yet bring some serious harm. You mark my words. Uh, tweens are a troubled phase, Cousin Amaranth. He comforted her. Uh, how is Goldfather doing? That was what they called Old Rory. Uh, would he be willing to have a quick private conversation with me before dinner? Uh, Rory is always busy. Since Daddy died, almost everything has been left for him to manage. I do what I can to help, at least in the hall. Amaranth said the last sentence with a good deal of satisfaction. But I am sure he would object to talking with you. You know how much he loves your company. He is in the office. I'll take you there. Amaranth led him down the hallway, passing through many doors and two living rooms. Stopping at a beautiful rounded door in the next hallway, Amaranth knocked on the door, called her brother, and explained that Bilbo had arrived and wanted to see him. Soon, Bilbo was sitting in an armchair in front of a window, watching the gloom outside and the moon reflecting on the brandywine, while eating some snacks and drinking tea. Goldfather seemed old and bore a very tired look, but as Amaranth had already predicted, a good conversation with interesting and smart people was still an undeniable pleasure, and Bilbo was one of his favourite cousins for this. He laughed at an old <laughs> anecdote about a failed rabbit hunt that Bilbo told, while Bilbo sat trying to find the best time to bring up the subject that brought him to Brandywine Hall. <laughs> That's it, my cousin, Bilbo said, sighing. We are no longer the young, cheerful boys who ran all over the Shire after butterflies and rabbits. We are old. Oh, I am old, Goldfather replied in jest. I would like to know what you are drinking to keep this appearance, cousin. For exercises I do know are not. He finished by pointing at Bilbo's tight vest. Bilbo was already 99 years old, while Goldfather was 87. But, in appearance, Bilbo looked like 50, and he was widely known as being well-preserved, and was always the subject of speculation among the relatives. <laughs> I think my wrinkles vanish in the same proportion as my belly grows, Bilbo choked, slightly embarrassed but getting a laugh from old Rory. He seized the opportunity and tried a change of conversation. The time had come. <laughs> I, I, I would like to discuss a slightly more serious subject, if I may, cousin. Bilbo started a little awkwardly. Goldfather looked deeply at him and sighed. And I think I already know the reason for that conversation, Master Baggins. Goldfather replied by putting the teacup on the coffee table. You came to adopt our Frodo and take him to Bag End. Am I right? Are my intentions that obvious? Bilbo said without thinking. Goldfather laughed. <laughs> you had been visiting us much more often than usual, cousin. And I see how great you two get along. I just deduce the obvious. Goldfather seemed proud of his own insight. And what do you say? Bilbo asked uncertainly. Goldfather suddenly got serious. Well, I must admit, I don't like the idea of our Frodo living on those sides. Those people of Harbiton are queer. I don't want Frodo to end up like them. I never understood why Belladonna let Bungo build such a grandiose hobbit hole in that place, with so many good lands in the Buckland. Goldfather saw Bilbo's disappointed face and smiled. But I don't want those sackville bagginses to take over our beloved Belladonna's bag end either. Detestable people. And I know Frodo will have everything he needs with you, Bilbo. I know you won't let him get into trouble, if you know what I mean. Goldfather didn't want to say the word adventures, 
but he knew Bilbo understood the message. He looked at the window with a sad look. Since our old father died, I have got a lot of responsibilities. And I know I haven't given Frodo the attention he deserves since Drogo and Primula passed, too. Amaranth does what she can, but I'm afraid Frodo is just another one here with no one to take care of him properly. I like that little boy very much. And as much as this moving hurts me, I prefer that he stay with you and be an honest and respectable Baggins. I'm going to take care of him like a son, cousin. Frodo will be my heir. Seven witnesses in all. Everything according to our laws, Bilbo said, trying to reassure that his intentions were serious. Ha! <laughs> Woe to you if you don't, Goldfather said with a smile. Woe to you! Bilbo fiddled with his ring in his pocket. He was waiting for Frodo in room two, looking at one of the paintings on the wall, pretending to pay attention to it. Bilbo! Frodo burst into the room and threw himself into a tight Baggins embrace. You told me you would come in early August. I'm so glad you decided to come early. Frodo looked at him more closely. Are you okay? You seem more serious than usual. Uh, sit here, Frodo, my boy. Bilbo asked as he sat in the armchair next to the door. I've been thinking about it for a while. Actually, quite a while. I know you like Master Hamfast and Little Sam, and you see, if you accept, I'm going to do everything within the Shire's law, seven witnesses and everything. Frodo looked confused. Well, what I want to tell you is that if you accept, we can celebrate our birthdays together, with comfort, without all that rush from Bywater to Buckland, if you know what I mean. In fact, I'm not getting anything. What exactly do you want to tell me? Frodo asked with anxious eyes. Bilbo stood up. He could not give an announcement of this magnitude while sitting. Well, Frodo, my boy, I'm inviting you to come and live with me in Bag End. He stopped in front of Frodo, with his hand swirling the magic ring in his pocket. Frodo seemed to be absorbing what he had just heard. Are you meaning... To live with you, in Bag End, forever. Yes, yes, Bilbo said, forever. And gave him that affectionate smile so well known. So, Frodo, my boy, what do you say? Frodo stood up with a jump. <laughs> when are we leaving? He said, beaming, giving him the same affectionate smile. Bilbo was happy. Now Bag End would have one more Baggins, and he a friend again. <laughs>